Well, good morning, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters and my dear young people. It certainly is a, a privilege for us to come together around the Word of God, and we thank our God that in these days, even though we are restricted by COVID and the different things that are going on in the world around us, that we can still come together and share in the richness of His grace and of the Word together. And we pray that our time will be profitable, and we hope to join you later on in the discussion, but we hope that that discussion takes place throughout the day. Well, God willing, we hope to spend this week looking in detail at the vision of the man of one, as seen by the prophet Daniel and the apostle John. Now, these are visions of the saints. They are word paintings that illustrate God manifestation. It's a picture of perfect discipleship, with each element indicating what we must become in our lives now if we want to be part of the multitudinous Christ in the future. So we'd like to begin in the book of Daniel and chapter 10, if you could turn that up. And we do ask that you do turn these passages up, even though we are doing this remote. It's still useful to see these things in our own Bibles. We begin in this vision where we see these contrasts. There are contrasts all through the Bible. We have the seed of the man, the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. We have the kingdom of men versus the kingdom of God. We have Rome versus Jerusalem. We have the four uh, unclean beasts that rise up out of the sea in Daniel chapter 7, contrasted with the four living creatures, or the cherubim, that we have in the vision of Ezekiel, the seraphim in Isaiah, and the combination of the both of them in the book of Revelation. We also have the man that is described in Daniel chapter 2, which of course is this great image of man, the image of the kingdom of men, and it stands in contrast to the man in the vision of chapter 10, uh, the man that Daniel sees, that John sees, that Isaiah and Habakkuk see in, in vision. So we want to begin with Daniel in Jan Daniel chapter 10, and we read there in verse 1, it's the third year of Cyrus king of Persia that a thing is revealed to Daniel whose name is called Belteshazzar. Now, the third year of Cyrus would put Daniel at around 87 years of age. And this comes just after Daniel and the lion's den when he has this vision. So if we think that, you know, we're getting on in years and that we're retiring from the truth and our challenges are done, cheer up, saints, it's going to get worse. That's when quite often we meet our, our Daniels in the lion's den. It's when Caleb fought his giant. Um, several things take place when people are in their older years. So certainly we we're, we're excited when we see Daniel at the end of his life giving this glorious vision. So he says that the thing was true, but at the, it, at the time appointed was long. And he says, I understand the thing and had understanding of the vision. And in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks and ate no pleasant bread. Neither came flesh or wine into my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all three weeks until the three full weeks were fulfilled. Now, I have been on a, on a fast for about 48 hours. Um, I don't know that I could last three full weeks, but it's the end of these three full weeks that Daniel sees this vision. And the interesting thing is that this is how Daniel starts in the book. He refuses to eat the king's meat. And yet, here we have him at the end having this vision. Three full weeks goes by, and this is what he sees. So we come to verse 4. It says, In the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, or the Euphrates, or sorry, the, the Tigris as we would know it, he says, I lifted up mine eyes, and I looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen. So we're told here in this vision that I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. And Strong's gives us the idea of what this certain man is all about. The Hebrew word is the word achad, from which we, we have the prayer of the Jews, Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohanu Adonai Achad, hear, O Yahweh, Israel, Yahweh our God is one Yahweh. So that's the idea here. We have one man. And that's the same picture that the Lord Jesus Christ paints for us when we come to the New Testament. This is the goal. We're looking at the end result in Daniel, the end result in, in the book of Revelation, but this was what the Lord was praying for. So turn, if you would, in your Bibles to John chapter 17. A familiar prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, but now put these words in terms of the man of one or the certain man of Daniel chapter 10. The Lord prays in verse 20 of chapter 17. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, thou in me, that they may be made 
perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So this idea of them being made perfect in one, becoming part of the multitudinous Christ. And this is the whole idea of God manifestation. The picture of perfect discipleship with each element indicating what we, what we must become in our lives now, if we want to be part of the multitudinous Christ in the future, to be perfected. Now, the Greek word there is the Strong's number 5048. It's the word teleo, uh, which the idea has to bring to completion, to make perfect, or to complete something. Now, it's interesting that this word is picked up and used in the Septuagint. Uh, if we go to Second Chronicles chapter 8 and verse 16, this is what we read. All the work of Solomon was prepared unto the day of the foundation of the house of Yahweh until it was finished. So the house of Yahweh was perfected. So that's the idea there in the, in the, uh, in the Septuagint is this word perfected. Now in the Hebrew, it's the word shalem, uh, 8003, which means to complete, to make safe, to be peaceful, to be perfect, to be whole, to be at peace. And of course, it's where we get the word shalom from. So that's how it is utilized in this word. And the same idea is picked up in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse 9, when he says here that he changed them, saying, Thus shall you do in fear of, he charged them, sorry, thus shall you do in the fear of Yahweh, faithfully and with a perfect heart. So the idea is a wholesome heart, matured or complete. And that's what we're looking for, is perfecting of the saints, the completing, like the house of God was completed, but having a perfect, a wholesome heart. And that's what we're looking for um, in each and every one of us, or what God is looking forward to. And the, the same idea is picked up in the New Testament. Um, John chapter 4 and at verse 34, we read there that Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. And that's the same word, teleo, which is the idea of perfecting. It comes up in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Same idea, the perfecting of the saints, the sanctified ones. And then again in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23, to the general assembly, the ecclesia of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So this is the justification process that leads to our perfection or our completion. And that's the picture that we have in this multitudinous Christ. It is a body of believers. So when we look at the man of one, it is a picture of the multitudinous Christ. And it's not a picture we're unfamiliar with. It's the idea the metaphors are used throughout the Bible. We have them in, in um, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the ecclesia. He is the savior of the body. So the picture of Christ as the head of the ecclesia. And the body of Christ, it comes up in 1 Corinthians 12, and we read there in verse 12, the body is one, he hath many members, or hath many members, and all the members of that body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And verse 14, the body is not one member, but many. And verse 18, now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And so this is the concept that we have there, and it comes down to verse 20, you are many members, but one body. And in verse 27, you are the body of Christ and members in particular. So this is not something we're not familiar with. It comes up in the New Testament. But it goes all the way back to Daniel and to John, as we'll see in a moment, these visions of the perfected Christ. So the picture in Daniel chapter 10 uh, and the symbols that are given are symbols of perfect discipleship. Now, that's the goal. That's what we're all aiming for. And we read this in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 21. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So this is the; these are the attributes that we must develop 
if we want to be part of the multitudinous Christ in the kingdom age. Now we intend to spend some time looking at and examining each element and seeking what we need to develop in our and work on in our own individual lives. And this is the hope that we have to be part of the man of one and everybody that has hope that hope in themselves, it says, purifies themselves. And that's the process we want to go through, is looking at our lives and seeing what do we need to change? How do we need to purify so we can be part of the body of Christ in that future age? Well, let's begin then looking at this man of one. One of the ideas that were given right from the beginning is that this is a multitudinous or a corporate figure. So we read in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 6, the body was like a barrel, his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes as, as lamps of fire, his arms and his feet like unto polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And so we'd like to just focus on that corporate picture, the vo voice of a multitude. Now, it, it also comes up in, in Revelation chapter 1, when we see the man of one there, that we'll come and look at in a moment. But we read there, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, and we find that his is the voice like the sound of many waters. So we're given a clear idea what this is. If we look at that voice of a multitude, the word there in the Strongs in the Old Testament is hamon, which means to murmur, to roar, a crowd, a multitude. Um, and this idea is given in, in, in Genesis chapter 17, where Abraham is made a father of many nations. We have the whole multitude of Israel in, in, in 2 Samuel 6 and verse 19. And the sound of the abundance of rain in 1 Kings 18 and uh, verse 41. It's the idea of a great host. It's this multitudinous sound. And it's the same one we get, we think of Hammon Gog, the multitude of Gog. That's the same word that's given to us here. So this, this voice of a multitude is the voice that he speaks. And it's interesting there that it's, um, it's that sound of many waters. It's the idea of, of this multitudinous voice. And um, when we look at that word voice, it means to, to call aloud, to, to sound, to noise, or to thunder. And it's given to us in, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. They heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And so this is the voice that was heard of the El Elohim right at the beginning. And it's in this case, it's the voice of a multitude like the roaring of thunder or waters. Now, this figure um, has this, this multitudinous voice, and, and probably the best analogy I can give was when my son was um, about uh, 13 years old. Um, we accompanied him on a school trip, and um, we went to my favorite game, baseball. And um, there were 60,000 children in this, uh, this um, arena, or whatever they call it, the, uh, the, the stadium where they play baseball. And, and that 60,000 children, the announcer said, you know, we want you to sing the national anthem um, against the Americans. It was Canada versus America in this game. And, um, you know, not patriotic at all, but when 60,000 children all burst into song in a shrill voice, it was quite something else. It was the noise of a multitude. Now, it was much more shrill, perhaps more like the lightning than the thunder. And it was so loud that I actually couldn't hear for about three days after afterwards, uh, but it kind of gave you this idea of the roaring of a crowd. And so this is what's used of the Elohim in the garden, the voice of mighty thundering also in Sinai in Exodus chapter 9 and verse 28. So this is this multitudinous voice, like the voice of many waters. Now, when we look at this idea of the waters, it's given to us, the interpretation of, of waters in scriptures is given in Revelation 17 and verse 15. And this is to, talking about the great harlot system. But he gives us the interpretation, the waters which thou sawest and which the harlot sat were peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So it's, it's symbolic of a great group of people. And it's also the voice of the saints, right? So in, in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 2, he says, I heard the voice from heaven 
as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And again in chapter 19, the voice of this great multitude, the voice of many waters, the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So again, we have this contrast. We have the waters on which the harlot sits, and we have the waters on the other hand, which are symbolic of the saints. And this is the man of one whose voice is like the voice of many waters. And so it is basically the word of the saints, which is the word of God. It's what they speak out of their mouth. So when we take this a little bit further and we, we look at the waters in the Bible, we have in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and at verse 1, we're told, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O ye saints, or sorry, and, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. So when this man of one speaks, what we're hearing is the voice of Almighty God, because they are all speaking the word of God. Now, if we come to Isaiah 55, we have the same idea here. In Isaiah 55 and at verse 10, As the rain cometh down in the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth the bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I speak, and it shall prosper to the thing whereunto I send it. So Isaiah tells us that the word of God has purpose in it, and it's going to go and do what God imagined for it to do. His purpose will be accomplished in his word that is spoken. And so when the saints go out as this multitudinous body and they speak the word as all of us should be doing, then what's happening is it is accomplishing the word of God. It is calling many to righteousness. Now, the other interesting thing is that superimposed over this, this picture of the saints, they are likened to the dew of the earth and the morning of resurrection. So in Isaiah 26, we read there in verses 19 to 20, thy dead shall live. My dead body shall they arise, and I've eliminated the italics here. Awaken, sing ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. So this is talking about the resurrection of the body of Christ. And um, we're looking here uh, to the future age. Now, the, the uh, translators didn't understand what this meant. They didn't understand God manifestation. So they put extra words in there to try and make sense of it. But when we read it in the original, it doesn't have those words. It's the body of Christ that is rising, my dead body. And it's likened to being the dew as the dew of herbs, because these are those that have spoken the word of God. They've been part of that word as it's gone forth and accomplished what God had for it to do. Now, this is what we learned of uh, many of us in elementary school. Um, going back to our primary school, our, our early days when we were eight, nine, ten years old, we learned about the, the water cycle. And it really comes from this picture that we have in the scriptures. Um, God uses these things to, to illustrate this to us. So in Isaiah 57 and at verse 20, we read, The wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. So the morass of humanity is like a sea that's a filthy sea. It casts up mire and dirt. But over imposing over all of this, or superimposed over this, is the sun, which in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, we read about the sun of righteousness would arise with healing in his wings. And of course, we think of the sun working upon us, energizing us um, with the word. And what happens is, is naturally, the sun will distill, the, distill those little dew drops, cleansing them of all impurities and, and bring them up into the heavens, into the clouds. And of course, that's what happens with the, with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ upon us. We are separated, sanctified out of the sea of humankind. We lose those impurities. Our minds are cleansed. Our bodies are washed with the water of the word. And so we, we have this, this change that takes place as we are elevated and become part of what is called in Hebrews chapter 12, a great 
cloud of witnesses that adorn the heavens and eventually will be part of the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. So this is the picture that we have here at the saints. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ working on the morass of humanity, separating out of it little dewdrops that he's going to use as the water of the word that are going to speak the word to all those around and they are going to separate people out to that purpose other people to become one with the Lord Jesus Christ, with his Father, and with the saints. So that's the work that we're all supposed to be involved in. So we see this man of one, when he speaks like the voice of a multitude, like the voice of many waters, it is those waters that have been separated out of the world. So just summarizing then what we've looked at so far, the man of one is a picture of the multitudinous Christ. John and Daniel were taken in vision, uh, right in vision into the kingdom to see the finished results of this multitudinous Christ. The elements that are described here represent the characteristics of Christ, and we have to develop these characteristics now if we hope to be part of the man of one in the future age. Now, we'd like to take a little cruise and we'd like to go to the shores of the Mediterranean and join our brother John. If you would, come to Revelation chapter 1, where Daniel was by the river Hiddekel, or the Tigris. John is on the Isle of Patmos and is by the seashore as he sees this vision. So it's a very similar vision to Daniel's. Um, it's about 655 years after Cyrus's reign. Um, he reigned around 559 BC, and it's a very similar picture that we have. And so we read here about John on the Isle of Patmos. So in verse 9, I, John, also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he's been separated out. He's there for the word of God and the testimony, right? So he's one of those little droplets that speaks with that voice of the multitude. Well, what is it that John encounters on this island? So we read here what he sees. He's taken in vision. Right, so this is what we have here. I was in spirit in the Lord's day, and I heard behind me the voice of a trumpet. It's a great voice, the voice as of a trumpet. But notice here that he was in spirit. So his vision is much more than virtual reality, it's spiritual reality. John is in the vision, participating in it in every sensory level, the sight, the sound, the smell, the touch, and he's, he's taken into this vision. Now the word spirit there, of course, is the word pneuma in the Greek, meaning movement or breath of air, and it's also used of spirit nature. So he's kind of taken to that future age, and we, we pick these things up. It comes all the way up through the book of Revelation. Revelation Revelation 4, we read there in verse 2, immediately, I was in spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sits upon the throne. So it is taken to see things in the future age. We have it also in uh, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3, he carried me away in spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, right? So he's carried and he sees, and again, we have it in Revelation 21, he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me a great city, um, New Jerusalem. So these are things that John has taken in spirit to see in the future age. Now, indicators are given to us when this vision is. First of all, in the book of Revelation, we read in chapter 1, verse 1, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So when we're in chapter 1 and verse 10, we're given an indication. There was a great voice of a trumpet. Well, what is the trumpet? Well, of course, we know in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and at verse 16 to 17, it's the trumpet of the resurrection. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught away together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is the idea of the resurrection is behind him. He heard behind me the voice of a great trumpet. So the resurrection is in the past. So he's taken right into the kingdom age, and this is what he sees. Now, we just want to pause for a moment here and consider other visions like this to help us get into the picture. It's not exclusive to Daniel or John. Ezekiel experienced similar visions. So let's just take a quick journey back to Ezekiel. Just turn up Ezekiel chapter 8. Um, we have this picture here. So we have the, the cherubim visions, and they begin in chapter, well, there's one in chapter 1, but in chapter 8, it goes all the way through to chapter 11. So in Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 1 is where we begin this, this next vision. And we read there, it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, he says, I sat in my house and the elders of Judah sat before me and the hand of the Lord Yahweh fell there upon me. So here he is. He, he has this vision, and we read there, as he's sitting, an angelic visitor, frightening countenance, as we read of in, in verses 2 and 3, comes. And so we read, I beheld and lo, the likeness of the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, from the appearance of his loins uh, upward, the appearance of the brightness of the color of amber. And he reaches forth, and he takes um, this form of a hand, grabs a lock of Ezekiel's hair, and it says there that the spirit lifted me up between the heaven and the earth. So physically, his body is still in Babylon, but in vision, he's now taken all the way to Jerusalem. He's transported to the temple. He brought me, verse 3, in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh towards the north. And so he's taken in vision, and he sees there the cherubim. Behold, the glory of God of Israel was there, according to the vision that he'd seen in chapter 1 in the plain. So here's Ezekiel. He's grabbed by his head. He's carried off to Jerusalem from Babylon, and he's there in Jerusalem in vision. And at the end of the vision, so we have chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11. So we come to the end of chapter 11. If you just turn over to verse 24, we read there that afterwards the Spirit took me and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them in the captivity. So the vision I had seen went up from me. Then I spake to them of the captivity, all the things that Yahweh had showed me. So here is Ezekiel back amongst those that were with him in his house. And it's the same idea of Daniel and John. They are undergoing similar experiences. And to understand them, we have to project ourselves into that vision. See ourselves as being there and try to understand what is being depicted by the word of God here. So as we summarize this idea so far, the man of one is a picture of the multitudinous Christ. And when we look at this, John and Daniel were taken in spirit or vision to the kingdom to see the finished result of this multitudinous Christ. And the elements that are described are representative of the characteristics of Christ. Um, and we have to develop these characteristics now if we hope to belong to the man of one in the future age. So that is the challenge that is before us as we go through this. So let's then go back to John in Daniel chapter or in Revelation chapter one. And we have here this vision behind him. And um, this is what we're told. I was in spirit in the Lord's day, and I heard behind me the voice of a great trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, that which thou seest write in the book and send it to the seven ecclesias. So that's what John is told to do. He's told to write these things down, and he turns to see the voice that spake with him, and he, being turned, sees this, this great vision. So here he is, past the resurrection, in the kingdom age, told to write these down for our benefit, send them to the ecclesias, and he turns around to see who's talking to him. And we find there, as he turns around, being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. And of course, the man of one is between these lampstands. But we just want to look at the lampstands for a moment here. The lampstand is the, the Greek word luchina or luchnia, which is the idea of the candelabra, a lampstand, right? So this is not a candlestick, but it's a lampstand. And so when we think about this, it takes us in our minds back to Exodus chapter 25 
and at verse 31, the imagery is drawn from the law of Moses. Here it was a lampstand that was to be made out of pure gold, of beaten work shall the lamp be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knots, his flowers shall be of the same according to the six branches that shall proceed out of the lampstand. Their knots, their branches shall be of the same, and it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And this is what they were to make the, the lamp for. So what's fascinating here, it's a work of beaten gold. And the idea means it's hammered out. It's the same word that's used of the beating of the olive oil or the incense. Um, all of the targets of brass that were, were overlaid. So this is that beating of, of the, the, the lamp to create this lampstand. And the structure of this lampstand is fascinating in itself. Six branches coming out of the one in the middle. Right. So you have a center branch, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have six branches coming out of either side, which represent the saints, which have been hammered out. Right. So they've come out of great tribulation. So this is the picture of what we have in Revelation here, these lampstands. And we think about where the, the lampstand would have stood in the tabernacle. It was completely dark and it was a light shining in a dark place. So in Second Peter, chapter one and verse 19, we read we have a more sure word of prophecy, wherein you do well that you take heed as to a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. So this is the picture that we have. And of course, this is the word of God. Um, we read about it in Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So these saints, which are depicted as the great multitudinous voice, are also depicted here as the lamps, right? Because these lampstands are the ecclesias, right? So we think of the, the, the verses that we have in the scriptures where the Lord exhorts us back in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world, verse 14. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all that are in the house, right? So that's the idea of, of the saints being a light to the world that there are to give light to all that are in the house. And that's the responsibility of each ecclesial family. Now, when we go back to the law of Moses, the light for the lampstand in the tabernacle was lit by oil that had been collected from each of the families. We read this in, in Leviticus 24 verse 1. Yahweh spake to Moses saying, command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. So this is what the children of Israel had to do. It's the same that's true today. The light of any ecclesial lamp is only as bright as the combined efforts of each family to crush the oil down and bring it to the ecclesial lamp. We cannot just simply fuel the ecclesial lamp at Bible school. It has to be done in individuals, homes, and amongst these families doing the Bible readings and studying the Bible. So that's the picture we have here, a simply fascinating picture. And it had to be the best of the oil that was brought. And so here's what the Lord tells us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. We're given the, the answer to the riddle, the mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven ecclesias, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven ecclesias, right? So we're given a very clear picture that these lampstands are the seven ecclesias um, which John was writing to. So when we look at this idea of a lampstand, it is, of course, the ecclesias of God that are supposed to be giving the light to all that are in the house, to be shedding that light forward. And that's a challenge for us in the days of COVID. We've got to be creative. We've got to think of ways that we can make our light shine, even in a dark world like we have today. And when we can't have perhaps our public efforts like we once had, um, we need to see what we can do to, to bring this about. And that often will take place individually. Well, the lampstands are described as the seven spirits of God in, in Revelation chapter four, just over the page. In verse 5, out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire before, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
Now this is picking up on the imagery that we have in Zechariah chapter 4. So let's turn to Zechariah chapter 4 for a moment. This is the picture that we have. Zechariah chapter 4, I looked and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes of the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. So this is the picture again of these, these lamps, which is in Zechariah. It's also in the book of Revelation. And in verse 6 we're told, This is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith Yahweh of hosts. Right. So this is the spirit, which in verse 10 we are told, who has despised the day of small things? They shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with, whose, uh, with those seven. They are the eyes of Yahweh, which run to and fro throughout the whole world. So this is the picture, the eyes of Yahweh running to and fro, the seven spirits, the seven lamps. This is what we're supposed to be all about. So... In the middle of this picture now, John is introduced to this man of one. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and the hairs were like white as wool and as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass as they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So John meets one like the Son of Man. Now, we've got to be careful when we read these things. It's like the Son of Man. He's not seeing literally the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a corporate image expressing sign and symbol. It's the multitudinous Christ. And each character has special significance. Remember, like and as are similes. They are used to describe other words. And so these characteristics that we see here in this man of one are going to be picked up in the letter. So just take a look here in Revelation chapter 2 over the page. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 1, we read that he holds the seven stars and is in the midst of the lampstands. And then down in verse 5, we're told that if we don't walk in his ways, he will remove our lampstands. And in verse 12, he will use the sword of his mouth against those that were not carrying the truth in the Pergamum Ecclesia. And in verse 18, he informs them that his eyes are like flames of fire and his feet as brass. And in chapter 3 and verse 1, he tells them that he has the seven spirits, right? And, it, and, and that's the picture that he has. He has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And he reminds them there in chapter 3 and verse 4 that they are to walk with him in white, right? So this is the idea. He's clothed in white. They are also to walk with him in white. So those pictures that we have in chapter 1 go through all the letters of the Ecclesias. They're found all the way through. And this is the aspects repeated over and over for emphasis. And we have to try and, and bring these things into mind when we read these and help them help us govern our lives as we consider these aspects. And so we want to stop for a moment and just consider what he says here, the seven stars um, that are in his right hand. Now, the word there for star is the word aster in the Greek, from which we get asteroid, a star or a group of stars, a constellation. So the Latin word is stella. And uh, this was no problem for me to remember because um, my daughter used to love this book called Stella Luna when she was a little girl. I had to read it to her over and over again in the light of the moon. Right. So this is the idea of Stella. Um, so we have interstellar, uh, different words like that, which perhaps we are familiar with. Now, they are in his hand, and we are left with no doubt what they are. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest, and the seven golden lampstands. Well, the seven stars are the angels of the seven ecclesias, and they are held in his hand. And the word there in, in the Greek is 2902, kriteo, and the idea is to lay hold of, to have power, to be powerful, to be chief or master of, to rule, to hold fast, to keep carefully and and faithfully, which means Christ is in control of them because he has appointed them. And we've always got to remember that in whatever ecclesia we are, whatever role we are in, we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and we want to be in his hand and controlled by him. So when we look at this, and we, we take this idea of being in his hand, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 33. 
And at verse 3, we get this idea way back in Moses' prophecy. Yea, he loved the people, all his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. So this is the idea of them being in his hand. And it's like Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, this idea of stars. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. So this idea of lampstands, of stars, of shining lights, of lighting the darkness, right? We have to ask, you know, how are we faring? Um, they are turning many to righteousness. That's obviously preaching. And we think back to the words of the Lord, the, the light that is set upon a hill that cannot be hid, but gives light to all around, right? But what about us, brothers and sisters? If we are to be part of this man of one, if we are to be the stars in his hand that turn many to righteousness, the lamp that is set upon the hill, how fair are preaching efforts? You know, what, what are we doing? Have we, have we looked at this? This is what we're supposed to be in the kingdom age. Well, well, what about right now? How are we doing ecclesially? As an ecclesia, what is our effort in preaching right now? And that's a challenge, but what are we doing? And what are we doing personally in our own lives. So this is the real challenge for us when we look at these things. So then when we, when we consider this and we, we set our minds and our hearts upon this idea of this new heavens that we read about in Daniel chapter 12, the stars of heaven, it comes up also in Second Peter. Seeing then that all these things should be dissolved, the world that we're in is going to be done away with, and we get a taste of that with COVID, all these things that people get involved in getting paused and put on hold, and, and they're getting very excited about that. They can't go to their bars and their restaurants and their sports events. Um, all of that's going to be taken away. Seeing that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless." So this is the idea. If, if we want to be part of that man of the one in the future, the new heavens and the new earth, the stars like the stars in his right hand, turning many to righteousness now, what kind of people ought we to be? We're supposed to be in diligence that we may be found of him in peace. That's that same word shalom or salem, uh, the idea of, of wholeness or oneness without spot and blameless. So what we need to be doing is making every effort. And so this is what we have in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Speaking to the star angels, right, to the, the leaders of the ecclesia, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock which is, over which the Holy Spirit hath made your overseers to feed the flock of God which he has purchased with his own blood. This is the message to the ecclesias. And so, brothers and sisters, um, we really need to consider the privilege of our calling and what we need to be about. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, this is what Paul says. Wherefore, I therefore, sorry, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and weakness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body uh, and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And that's a tough thing to do. But the man of one is one man. Now, ecclesially, sometimes we struggle with that. We divide over all kinds of issues. It's our nature to be divisive. But what the Lord wants of us is to be one man, is to, to pull things together and to, to be united in the word, keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. So this is why God has equipped us for this work of constructing the man of one. And we read this in Ephesians chapter four, verse seven. Each of us have different gifts that we bring towards us. To every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. 
Now, we don't have spirit gifts, but we all have things that we can contribute. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that's what we are talking about here. We're talking about the perfect man, teleos again. Uh, this idea of being complete, full of age, full grown, full maturity. We all have a work to do about bringing that man to maturity. That's the goal to help every single one in our ecclesia get to that point. We're not, we don't begin there, brothers and sisters. We have to get there. So we can't look at our brothers and sisters and say, well, he's not there. Yet. Well, of course he's not there yet. Neither are we. But our goal and our role is to help one another get there. And so he says that the full measure, right? The word is metron, from which we get the idea of a measuring vessel. Uh, the word meter comes out of this. And it's the idea of determining the quality or quantity of things, uh, dry liquids or a measure of capacity, right? So this is the idea of, of measuring the cup to the brim with the characteristics of Christ. That's the way we want to be. The stature, the age, the time of light, the, the, the full age, the maturity, um, we're not going to get there overnight. We need to grow into this and the fullness of Christ. Uh, the idea of plumora, or pl pleroma, um, from which we get plethora, right? The whole idea of this whole thing coming together. It's been filled up, a ship filled with soldiers or sailors and abundance. And it's the word that's used in, in Mark of 12 baskets of fragments. So this is the goal and this is the role that we have ahead of us. And so this is the ultimate goal in, in what God is doing in the Ecclesias, is trying to develop the components that will fit into this man of one. So Ephesians 4 verse 14, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So this is the idea that it's going to grow, it's going to cause to, to grow, to increase, to become greater. Vines defines it as to, to increase in growth of that which lives naturally or spiritually. So these characteristics need to be cultivated. And I can remember, um, you know, doing Bible seminars years ago and being frustrated with, um, you know, the, the, the progress of some of, of the people who eventually became brethren and sisters. And I remember phoning my Uncle Paul. Um, he was back in, in Prince George where I'd grown up and I was about 4,000 or so kilometers away and, and going saying, like, I'm just so frustrated. And he said, listen, young man, he says, you're trying to grow plants by pulling them out of the ground. You can't do that. You've got to let them grow. You've got to let them mature. And so it was a great lesson for me. And that's the idea here of, of you know, allowing the ecclesia to grow. And he also says that we are to be fitly joined together. And the idea means to, to join closely, um, to, to frame together. The word sun, basically, which is with um, harmos. So it's, it's with harmony, building together. And, and the word lego as well, uh, to, to choose, right? To be fitly framed. So this is the idea of, of bringing these things together, being fitly framed. Each member is part of the overall construction. Vines actually puts it very in interestingly. He says, according to the effectual working of the ministration rendered in due measure by every part. So everybody has a role to play in the ecclesia and the question I guess we have to ask ourselves is what is my role what am I doing in the ecclesia to encourage the the growth of this man of one not just of my own development but of my brothers and sisters of the young people of of the the children through the Sunday school what is the role that I am performing to help bring about this great work that the Lord says this is the work I have to do to, to form this man of one, that they may be one as we are one. So when we consider what we've looked at this morning then, brothers and sisters and young people, we have here the summary that's given. We have the, the seven stars symbolizing the spirit-guided eldership or messengers who were sent to each ecclesia to assist in its growth or maturity. 
and that they are to be the servants of Jesus Christ, being in the power of his hand, commissioned and endowed by him for the work. And that also, when the word of God was completed, the radiance of the spirit gifts would disappear. Um, <clears throat> they would basically come to this situation where they would be giving that word of life through the scriptures of truth, teaching the word as it remains by the means of the ecclesias, fortified and, and, and matured. And the goal, of course, would be to bring the ecclesias into that perfect man, growing up into the head, which is Christ. And so when we look at that, brothers and sisters, we ask the question, what are we contributing to the man of one in our own ecclesia, to building up that man of one? And are we involved in the effective ministration to our brothers and sisters aimed at building them up? Is that what we are doing? Are we turning many to righteousness? Because if we are brothers and sisters, blessed is the man whom his Lord, when he comes, will find so doing. He says, of a truth I say unto you that he will make him rule over all that he hath. Luke chapter 12, verses 43 to 44. So as we consider these things together and as we look at these symbols of this man of one, it's a, it's a great study in discipleship, a great opportunity for us to look at ourselves and say, how do we fit into this picture of the man of one? And remember, it's, it's a growth period. It's a period of development. And if certain things are not in line with it, how can we change our lives so that we do become part of this man of one? Manifesting the characteristics now so that we can also manifest them in the future. Thank you for your time and attention this morning.